So that leads us to the next section, which is <laughs> path effects. So I've mentioned a couple times that path effects have some phenomena that we kind of try to capture in the model. The first is geometric spreading, which is related to the energy dissipation as the wave front travels from a point source, which we can think of as, of, as an earthquake, radially, rad as it radiates outward over an ever-increasing space. So the analogy I like to use is think of Earth as being just a body of water. There's no land on Earth. An earthquake would be, say, an asteroid or something hits Earth, so Earth is just covered in water. That would be like a water droplet. Right where that asteroid hit the water surface, you're going to have high waves. For example, we can see the big waves here right where the water hits. But as it radiates outward over an ever-increasing area, the, the, the height of these waves gets smaller and smaller. And so that's just energy loss associated to the energy having to be spread out over a larger area. Right. So it's not really energy lost, though. So this is not a, a an attempt. It's not losing energy. It's just dividing it over a wider circumference or area. And therefore, but you haven't lost the energy, right? Exactly. It's kind of it's just spread. transferred in different areas. OK, cool. And then analytic continuation, which is the bigger one that I'm talking about in this um, presentation, is energy loss that's associated with the mechanical propagation of the wave. In other words, we know that the wave is going to travel through some medium. And because we live in the real world, there's friction. And that friction will essentially convert some of that energy into heat. And that conversion from um, wave amplitude, essentially, to heat will cause the amplitudes uh, to decrease over time. So it's an energy transfer mechanism. The analogy I use for this is think of a projectile in water, where the speed would be the, the, the amplitude of the, the seismic wave. So when the projectile is first fired, it's traveling really fast. There's not a lot of friction on that projectile at the very beginning. But as it travels further and further, friction is going to accumulate the drag forces are going to get higher and higher over that distance, and so it's going to slow down. And so that's what anal anesthetic attenuation is. It's energy loss associated to essentially energy transfer, mostly through friction, as the wave travels over an ever-increasing distance. So that's energy loss. The first one is just spread, and this is just literally converted into other forms of energy. Okay, cool. Exactly. I like that. So I have a bit of a thought exercise, which will tie it in to, to, to more of the real world. Assume we have a site just represented by this blue triangle, middle of California. I'm going to plot a couple of things. On the top, I'm going to plot intensity, so it's the level of shaking versus distance. On the bottom are within event residual, which remembers just the difference between a ground motion model and the observation. And any event-specific bias is also removed. So in theory, um, if if we have one site that we're looking at, the only thing that will be influencing the within what residual is the path. So let's assume kind of worst case scenario, you can have an earthquake anywhere around this site, but it's always at a distance of about 300 or so kilometers. Now, an ergodic model will tell us that no matter what the path, it's always going to give us this level of shaking. And obviously, with respect to a, a ground motion model, if, if it's truly uh, accurate, you're going to have a zero um, within a residual. But we know that that isn't the case. We actually have recordings. For example, we can have a red event, a blue event, and a green event. Assume that these events for the moment are identical, so the only thing that's different is the distance. What we will see in the data are just these points here. This blue event plots higher than our data point, the, the ergodic prediction. The green, a little bit lower, and the red, really low. And the only thing that's different, again, is the path. But what's different about these paths? It's they're traveling through different materials. So you can see, for example, in this blue event, it's traveling through the Sierra Mountain Range. Um, the green event's kind of traveling through the Central Valley. This red event's traveling through coast ranges and also some of the, of the Central Valley. And in this case, as you can see, that as the wave travels between these different materials, we get a change in slope if we're looking at the event residual. But there's also a small change of slope. It's a little harder to see in this top plot. But you get a change in slope when the wave travels between one material with some specified property 
to a different material that has different properties. But kind, kind of like the speed changes and therefore the energy gets dissipated differently. Exactly. Essentially, the damping of the materials is different. And so the energy trans, the, the amount of energy that's converted into heat um, would be greater or less, depending on the damping value. And, and this has to be compared to a basic value, though. I mean, to a, a reference. Yeah, to model. just a simple ground motion model, which is yeah. the, the black one. OK. But the question is, are how I drew these, are they correct? The answer is we don't know. Someone else could have come in and, and drawn these dashed lines instead of the dotted lines. So path modelers are essentially connected dot people. We get these dots that we have here. We know that we're going to start hopefully at zero. And we just draw a line or a curve in these cases and call it a model. And hopefully people use it and hopefully it gives a good prediction. So there's a lot of complexities that go into this, but there's some physical constraints that we can leverage to develop these models. This is tricky because you can't really get more points in between those two points unless you had an earthquake that happens exactly in the middle of the blue path. Then you could add a point to that, right? So so these are just based on physical. And that's what I find fascinating, I think, about, um, and this is kind of what got me hooked early on is that these are not just statistical models. These are also physics based models because you've got to make some assumptions on the shape of this curve, which is based on your understanding of the type of rocks. And see, all these have negative curvature or, you know, a increasing versus, you know, opposite kind of curvature. And so the shape of the curve is driven by the physics or your understanding of the physics, right? And exactly. so you, you're looking here and go, oh, OK. So that's what's fascinating is these little kinks that you've added. So you've added a kink and this changes in slope. And so do you do that? And oh, and I guess that's what you're going to go into because you can't really visualize. If I look at this, I'm like, oh, wait, uh, about this distance, there's something looks different. And so you can actually quantify these these maps. Right. That's what you're going to do is you're going to quantify. And here I visually in my brain, this is what's fascinating about the brain. I see it. There's a Sierra right there. And so something is going to happen there. So I'm going to do some sort of changes in my curve in this region. And then I've got something different here. And so what you're going to do is quantify these different figures here because the green one goes through all white. The black one goes through these mountain ranges, or the blue one, and then the red one goes through a different type of mountain ranges. And um, okay, yeah. So you pretty much just spoil the entire presentation. Uh. We can end it here. No, no, <laughs> it's 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 great because it's it's actually pretty pretty straightforward. I think when you look at it as a practical concept like this, but applying yeah. it in a model gets tricky, and that's that's where the modeling kind of gets interesting. Yeah, well, the way I see it is you've got it. My my take on things like this is you've got to understand what the physical, understand it. You don't have to quantify, but you have to understand what's going on. And then the math is there just to prove you right um, and to be able to generalize it and to implement it. Uh, but you kind of want to have a look at this and have, and that's why you started with a figure, right? You, you started yeah. with this versus the numbers. It's like, hey, you can actually, our brain is able to process this visually. Uh, and so now we're going to build a mathematical model that is going to agree with us. And if it doesn't agree with us, then that tells us something about our understanding of the physical model. And then one that you've got to iterate between the two um, and you got to converge to your thinking. You can't just go with the data and the numbers say this. But if it doesn't make physical context or sense, it's then you're misinterpreting the data but you have to have an understanding of it. So that's why I'm a big fan of sitting, thinking, and and then predicting just in your brain and then let the data or the analysis do the work. So, okay, yeah. cool. Exactly. And just as you said, we try to incorporate physical constraints into our model, not just let the data do what it wants. And so our path model is a function of geometric spreading and inelastic attenuation. And how it looks like in space, how we try to constrain it, is we have this first kind of phenomenon called saturation, 
which just means that over a very short distance interval, you don't see an appreciable change in the intensity of shaking. So between 0.1 and 0.2 kilometers, or like a difference of 100 meters, you're not going to see a big change in your um, amplitudes, assuming that the site conditions are the same. Really? So that's true? Uh, it's like, true for the most part. Do we, or do we just not have the data to prove it? And I mean, and if you fall into the crack, that's different kind of intensity as well. But so we do. Well, it's not necessarily you shouldn't think of this as being just at the site. You can be 100 kilometers away and 100 kilometers versus 101 kilometers are going to be pretty close to each other. Right. So it's just over a small interval of distance. There isn't a big change. But because you're in log scale. Yeah, because we're in log scale. The very we beginning, it. that's pretty small numbers. That's from zero. And maybe you shouldn't, maybe that, well, no, it, it could hit zero. No, log doesn't go, doesn't hit zero. So your blue line should not be touching. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just say that the lower limit's like point one. Oh, uh, okay, good. Okay. Um, and so, because I've heard of this, but I, I wasn't quite sure if it's true. But then again, we don't quite have enough data to really, and so we, we, put the saturation there because that's what we've observed yes well the saturation so, acts over all distances it's just in this log space we only see it at the short distances okay oh okay yes. so that's one that's i was going to mention at the end of the slide but i think it's good to mention it now is that all of these physical phenomena act over all distances it's just in our plots when we put plot them in a log distance space we see them they, they're mo most pronounced in different distance ranges. Okay. So that saturation, the not a big appreciable change over short distances. Um, the next thing is then our general curve, we know it bends downward. And geometric spreading, we model as a linear decay in log space. Obviously, the curve bends down a little more. So that's a hint of analytic attenuation. But Wait, it's... Can I pause you? Sorry, the distance is log space, but is my intensity log space or you're always in log space anyways, because it's... Intensity like... is also in log space. Okay. Generally. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So geometric spreading is just a, a linear decay in log space. So it's just a coefficient um, that captures the slope. It's going to be negative um, times the log of distance. And then analytic continuation, which we see mostly at far distances, because remember, the friction has to build up over a large distance, is going to attribute to this additional reduction of intensity, which we model as a coefficient CAA, an inelastic attenuation coefficient, times the arithmetic distance. But again, all three of these phenomena act over all distances. It's just in this space that I'm plotting, we see the features um, in different distance ranges. Well, because I mean, my take on it is, and and this is this is why I asked the question. So the intensity is in log space, right? And therefore, you see how it increases. So the analytic attenuation may actually be constant over distance in on a non-log space, right? It could be exactly. point two g's, but when you plot it in log space, at the higher values, it's small and then it's seen more at the lower values. And so it almost kind of like, that's another reason it's neat to plot things in log space because it shows you the amplitude within the effect at that amplitude. And so this analytic could actually be constant on intensity, but not on the log, it gets spread out at the smaller numbers because this is log space. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, cool. So this is a generic path model where we just assume a constant attenuation, no matter what material the path travels through. Um, but I'd like to kind of present some approaches to path model, kind of the history of, of where we've come from. We started off with, for example, NJA West 1 ground motion models. We didn't have a lot of data in areas. So you just used everything at your availability. We came up with a single value, no matter where your earthquake is, it attenuates at this rate. Then we have some broad regional models. NGA West 2 came around. We got 
good amount of data in California, China, Japan, Italy, a um, couple regions around the world where there was high instrument, a dense instrumentation. So we had a lot of data. So we could look at these region by region basis and come up with analytic attenuation coefficients for those regions that we model as a delta CAA. So this is kind of a regional adjustment where we have the global value. And let's say California is maybe a little bit faster. So we add on a, 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 ne a negative number. Or Japan's a little bit slower. So we'll subtract a, a value to account for these regional trends that we see. Um, so is that I, like the first step towards non-ergodic? So would you call that a non-ergodic? Th this is a very primitive non-ergodic model that most okay. people would not consider non-ergodic at all. But it does attempt to, to separate the spatial variability because if you have an earthquake in California versus an earthquake in China, they're going to be different. Okay. You'll, you, well, you'll get different predictions. So by that definition that I showed a couple of slides ago, it would be non-ergodic. Okay, so it's just a little bit less blue towards the yellow line. Exactly. Okay. okay. Then you can have local regional models in areas that you have a lot of data and it can still be a pretty large area. You can develop a kind of a, re a local specific model. An example would be Erdem et al. in 2019. They uh, made a model for the San Francisco, or not San Francisco, Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta region for earthquakes that occur in the Bay Area that travel towards the Delta. They found that some events attenuate faster, so we can see it bends down fast. The slope is more negative, as opposed to other events which are flatter, the slope is less negative. And so if you have an earthquake now in this area, you can apply this model. Whereas an earthquake in Southern California, you can still use the, the model here. So we're now separating from a statewide model to now kind of like a Northern California and a Southern California model, which I call a local regional model. And then kind of the more fancy, the more fancy version of models, which are currently available are cell-based methods, which were first proposed by Dawood and Rodriguez in 2013, which is where we take our area, in this case it's Japan, and we put a grid of cells on our area. And for each cell, we're going to compute an attenuation coefficient for each cell. And so our analytic attenuation that we have for a path, you would take a particular path. And any cell that your path travels through, you'll multiply the length of the path that through that cell times the analytic attenuation for that cell, sum up over your entire path length, and that gives you the attenuation. So this is the type of model where you see those kinks or the changes in slope in that intensity versus distance space. And this is some, uh, there are some advantages of these models and some drawbacks. And I wanna apply it to, uh, I wanna just refer, uh, bring it back to California because in 2019, Kuhn et al presented a model for California using the cell-based attenuation. Um, you can see it's the same function as before, except that their notation is theta 17 for the analytic attenuation. And they used NGA West too. So their data set has good coverage in Southern California, good coverage in the Bay Area, but obviously there's not a lot of paths in other parts of the state. There's, there's pretty much no data. In this case, data would be a path. You, you need a path to travel through your cell to estimate a, a coefficient for your cell. And so here I have the, the, the values that they got for each cell. And you can see the darker reds, are, the darker shades are less negative, the lighter shades are more negative. And you can see that we have regions of the state where we have slower attenuation, which would be the, the dark areas in the base, the dark areas down here, and faster attenuation, which would be the lighter areas up in the north and some lighter areas down by the Sultan Sea. What does faster attenuation mean or slower attenuation? So mean? Faster, this? faster attenuation would mean that you have more attenuation, meaning more energy is transferred into heat. So if we were to look at residuals, they would be bending downwards with distance. Whereas slower attenuation, you have less trans less heat transfer essentially, or conversion to heat. And so they would bend upwards with respect to a global ergodic model. Okay. And so it would, in shorter distances, your energy would decrease, your amplitude would decrease closer if it's a faster attenuation. So right. there wouldn't be much different if we just go back to this slide here. There wouldn't be much differences at 
near source or even intermediate distances. But at the far distances, if, if you have a faster attenuation, our model would bend down okay. sooner. It's steeper. Okay, yes, it makes steeper. sense. Okay, so you get less energy, less intensity as you're closer or farther in. Okay, yeah, got it. Going back to this one. The drawback of this approach, however, is in areas where you don't have data, you don't have good estimates. So this is the, the uncertainty of those estimates. And you can see the darker values are higher uncertainty. So work, this model only pr provides good improvements in the Bay Area and Southern California where there was data. Other areas of the state, there's large uncertainty. So work, th this model doesn't necessarily provide good predictions. The other drawback of this method Part, which is my criticism of it. I don't want to be too critical because this model is a good model and it's definitely an improvement over um, the energetic model, is that it's hard to understand. And by that, I mean, these are just arbitrary cells that are drawn on the state. Why are some cells that have more negative values? Why do other cells have less negative values? For example, in Northern California, we have two cells that might have the most negative and the most and the least negative values right next to each other. Why, what, what's, what's driving that difference? Um, because these cells are arbitrary, we, we don't know. It's kind of a mathematical model. And so there's no physical basis in a cell-based model. It's just a, a mathematical model. But I and, guess if you improve your mesh, then you would see a much better gradation. Exactly. Than changes of things right so yes. it, the mesh size just feels too big to be representative of the whole peninsula or something like that the the downside is you can't go too fine because then you don't have enough data to accurately estimate so it's you get trade-offs between your size of your your discretization and 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 the accuracy of your your estimates which we'll see later on because that also is true for, for what i propose okay 